it's a great honor to be able to give you a reprise of, of the keynote that I was asked to deliver at the International AIDS Conference in Durban in July. Um, and uh, this was the first keynote, the first panel, and I was extremely nervous. There were 18,000 people in the audience, and I was introduced by Grasa Macha, who was Nelson Mandela's wife. And sitting beside her was Princess Mabel of the Netherlands. So, um, I feel much more at home today. <laughs> Um, so, um, those of you um, who uh, were at the International AIDS Conference in 2000, it was also in Durban, 16 years ago. And it was the first time that the um, epidemic um, had a, a representation of the IAS Conference on African Soil. And it was a very moving experience for those of us who attended, and um, I reflected on that. Um, and, you know, Nelson Mandela appeared, and this was um, a year or two before his death, and talked about the need for support to tackle this epidemic from every sector, including the economic se sector. But um, the, a real hidden um, um, you know, hero at this conference was Edwin Cameron, who is a Supreme Court Justice um, in South Africa, um, a white gay man. Um, he stood up and gave a personal account of his life living with HIV. And he spoke of the two South Africas, one with access to antiretrovirals and one without. And as I returned to um, the bed and breakfast that I was staying at, which was way outside of Durban, um, I was thinking about the two South Africas because when I, was, I had arrived, I was looking for food. It was really late at night and I was hungry and all of the restaurants that I could find were closed and these children came out of the bush, and they were barefoot like this boy. And um, they were begging. And I said, well, look, you know, if you can help me find a restaurant that's open, I'll treat you all to dinner. Well, these kids were so excited. And, you know, of course, before I knew it, there was about 20 of them. And um, we all, they said, well, we'll take you to Steers. And I said, well, what's Steers? And they said, well, you'll see. It's the only restaurant that's open. So the, the group of them ran ahead, turned the corner, and it's like basically like a McDonald's. And there's a counter and the, and the people waiting to, to, uh, for us to line up. And the night watchman uh, came out from um, the bushes and said, you know, and was proceeding to, to strike these, these boys to get them to go away. And I said, no, 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 these children are with me. And so they all lined up and I gave them each a hamburger, french fries, and a shake. And it, the woman who served uh, us at the counter, she had tears streaming down her face, and she said, thank you, madam, for treating our children like human beings. And it was extremely emotional, and one little boy started to cry after he'd eaten a couple of bites of his hamburger. And I said, what's the matter? And he said in pidgin English, he said, I'm, I'm full, I cannot eat it, madam. And I said, well, I said, you can take it home then. And he said, I don't have a home. I live over here, and he pointed to the bush, and I said, well, I said, it's yours, you can have it, it it's, no one is going to take it away from you, and, and he looked at me with such shock that he could have this hamburger, you know, it just, um, I'll never forget these children, and, you know, I often wonder, where are they now? And it was my hope and my fantasy that someday, you know, maybe one or two of them would grow up to be a leader of South Africa. But, you know, I guess we'll never know. But what we can do is start to look at the statistics and see how South Africa has dealt with their HIV epidemic since 2000. Um, in fact, there have been some really positive signs. The number of HIV-positive children has declined 76% since 2009. The mother-to-child transmission rate has been reduced to 4%, and that has met the UN General Assembly's goal. Uh, South Africa has the highest number of people living with HIV on antiretroviral treatment in the world at 3.4 million, and this is a tremendous achievement. On the other hand, every week, about 2,400 adolescent girls and young women become newly infected with HIV. So clearly, there's more to be done. And youth matter, because South Africa differs substantially from the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of its age pyramid's structure. So um, here on the left, you see 1950, 
for the rest of South Africa on the top half of the slide versus Southern Africa on the bottom. And you see that by 2050, there's what Debbie Burks from OGAC calls the youth bulge. And I always think, well, I'm glad she isn't talking about me because I just turned 50. But you can see that there's a dramatic increase in people who are going to be, you know, in the young ages. And um, if we aren't careful and ensure that we are preventing new infections from occurring, we're going to see that this epidemic um, is, is not kept in check. But, you know, South Africa and, and Sub-Saharan Africa um, have... Um, another challenge, not just HIV. Um, TB um, is, um, a, you know, a, a, a real scourge, and it has been for quite some time. And I think this slide really brings this home. This is a slide that shows the reported TB cases in Cape Town, New York, and in London over the last century. And so um, you can see Cape Town in red, and the first thing to note is how it dwarfs um, the other two cities in terms of the TB case rate. But where it starts to take off in terms of TB incidence coincides with when the HIV epidemic started to really take off in South Africa. And this peaks at over 800 per 100,000. And that's just a, a, a staggering high um, incidence rate. And worldwide, about one in every AIDS-related death is actually attributable to TB. So um, those of you that are working in this area, um, um, we really need to bring the AIDS community and the TB community together. And in fact, for the first time, the international TB meeting was held in Durban right immediately before the International AIDS Conference with the hopes that these researchers, one of whom was Connie, um, could get together and, and, and inform each other's work. So what about the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa? Well, this region um, has, since the beginning of the epidemic, uh, shouldered about two-thirds of the global HIV burden, and that's still the case. However, there's still um, some hope because we've seen some advances in terms of um, um, the number of people who are anti on antiretroviral treatment, which has doubled um, since 2010. Um, and this is largely due to the, um, lar the largely due to the global fund and work um, from PEPFAR and many people on the ground who have ensured that um, there's equitable access. So since 2000, the number of new HIV infections has actually decreased 41 percent across Sub-Saharan Africa. AIDS-related deaths have dropped by a third um, as a result of the expanded um, ART access. And um, new HIV infections in 2015 um, have decreased by 4% in Eastern and Southern Africa, and that's um, some of the first good news that incidence is, is really being affected. However, once again, 25% of these new infections are women aged uh, 25 to 44, despite the fact that they only comprise about 11% of the population. So there's a very disproportionate number of young women becoming newly infected. And um, we also need to take into account that there's more room for improvement. There's other kinds of structural interventions that we can um, implement to make a, an impact on HIV incidence. And one of those is, is medical male circumcision. Um, this slide, which comes from a review that was published just a few months before the conference, shows HIV prevalence in, um, in the map um, uh, in blue versus um, uh, male circumcision prevalence on the right. And as you can see, um, the prevalence of HIV mirrors of that of male circumcision in terms of high HIV prevalence maps on to where medical male circumcision prevalence is low. So you can imagine that since we know from a, a number of trials that were completed um, years ago that medical male circumcision can reduce HIV incidence, that this, the um, impact on HIV incidence, if we scale it up, could be dramatic. And yet, bringing this um, intervention to scale has been challenging. So what about Middle East and North Africa? Well, and this is a region of the world that um, has seen a number of struggles. Even though the number of people living with HIV and AIDS is only 230,000, uh, only 17% of people living with HIV AIDS are, are receiving antiretroviral treatment in this region. And about 90% of the new infections are among key populations and their sex partners. And this is not unlike many other parts of the world. But one um, subpopulation that is at extreme risk is men having sex with men. 
the bottom part of this um, slide shows HIV prevalence among MSM from selected countries in the MENA region. And you can see that several of these um, have prevalence above 5%. And these are regions where um, not only um, is homosexuality very stigmatized, it's actually illegal. And so um, the, um, you know, the efforts to uh, Im improve access to uh, antiretrovirals and HIV testing and prevention are really thwarted due to um, the laws and policies in these regions. So globally now, in 2015, there are 36.7 million people that were estimated to be living with HIV and AIDS. This is actually down um, somewhat because of the advances with antiretroviral treatment. About 17 million of these are receiving antiretroviral treatment, so almost half. Um, and there has been a, a decrease in, of AIDS-related deaths by 43% since 2003. But again, we see this cup half empty or cup half full in terms of incidence. There's still almost 2 million new HIV infections globally. Another region, um, an a another area where we've seen some incredible advances over the last decade is with mother-to-child transmission. 85 countries have virtually eliminated mother-to-child transmission, which is a, a dramatic success. Um, however, only 31% of HIV-positive children are receiving antiretroviral treatment. And this contrasts to 66% uh, of pregnant women. So there's a huge gap in terms of um, women's children accessing treatment. And um, there are many ways that this could be improved, um, for example, by integrating um, immunization schemes um, with antiretroviral treatment or nutrition. In Eastern Europe and Central Asia, this is a region of the world where um, HIV continues to um, expand in terms of incident infections. This is a, a place where 1.5 million people are living with HIV and AIDS. There's been a 57% increase in new HIV infections since 2010 and only one in five people are receiving antiretroviral treatment. In um, Central Asia in particular, there's been an increasing um, number of migrants who are either internally displaced due to conflict or have um, migrated for other reasons due to disasters or wars. And so there's an increasing proportion of migrants who um, have a delayed diagnosis of HIV. And this um, will continue to be a struggle since um, this part of the world is in uh, significant turmoil. And if we take a closer look at Central Asia in particular, we see an interesting pattern. In um, countries like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, the epidemic first began among injection drug users and has since spread to their heterosexual partners. So now you see that as a result of this, heterosexually acquired HIV um, is above 50% compared to injection drug use. Whereas in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, we see that injection drug use is still a predominant driver because these epidemics are younger. But injection drug use is clearly an important driver of the epidemic in, in Central Asia. In Turkmenistan, uh, we have no data at all. Um, it's a closed country, and um, it's, it's been a struggle to get any information. Now, thinking about key populations, uh, we have estimates of HIV incidence among female sex workers, and um, I wanted to focus specifically on Sub-Saharan Africa because the um, HIV incidence, um, as shown in this middle column, is extremely high. But you'll note that it's very variable. So in countries like Kenya and South Africa, the estimates of HIV incidence among female sex workers, um, it goes from 3 to 25. Um, and so it, it makes it very difficult to, um, to, to target prevention activities. But it's not just um, how we count. It's not just who we count, it's how we count, because we really need to consider ways that we're measuring um, um, the um, fraction of the, of the population that are most at risk. And this is a slide that shows the estimated contribution of unprotected sex work across three epidemics um, in uh, Benin and uh, Burkina Faso and in Kenya. And as you can see um, on here in the... It's blue on your slide, um, that if we, we use the classic epidemiologic method to estimate population attributable fraction, or PAF, 
that we have a much lower estimate of the impact of sex work on these epidemics. Um, but if we take into account dynamic transmission models that take into account the fact that there's ongoing spread from sex workers to their partners and to the general population, and then if we project that out across um, the next um, you know, decade or so, so, we see that there's a much greater impact. So in red is the long-term impact using these dynamic transmission models. So they're a much more effective way of determining the impact. And these can help us decide how to allocate resources. And you know, one of the other challenges we have as epidemiologists is data quality. So we've, we've seen it's not just you know, who we're counting and how we're counting, but what we're using to actually count. And when we um, look at this slide, we see that less than 50% of lower and middle income countries have useful estimates of key populations. So um, in red are countries that have no data at all. And you'll see that many of these are in Africa. And so how can we plan an effective epidemiologic um, response when we don't even know who the denominator is? It's very, very challenging. Well, other ways that we can monitor the epidemic over time are with molecular epidemiology. So this is a slide showing molecular surveillance of HIV in China and shows increasing HIV diversity between key populations and, and within key populations. So we see um, that uh, this is for uh, men having sex with men, heterosexuals, injection drug users, um, blood transfusion recipients, and uh, those uh, who acquired HIV through mother-to-child transmission. And what we see is that there's a number of these circulating recombinant forms, or CRFs. And um, so in red, for example, is one, another in green. And you'll see that these differ um, between the populations. And so there's been increasing diversity over time and, um, and a different pattern depending on which subpopulation you're looking at. So this is not just important for monitoring the epidemic, but also for vaccine development, since most of the vaccine development efforts have been um, focused on uh, clade B and, and not um, these recombinants that might not respond as well. It's also important as um, epidemiologists to really consider um, that we are missing context if we just try to force people into boxes. Um, and one um, problem uh, we have encountered is that we conflate gender identity with sexual identity. And so there's ways to overcome this. Um, for example, um, with respect to people who are um, in the transgender community, um, you can disentangle gender identity through two steps. First, by measuring sex at birth, and um, second, by uh, asking people their current gender identity. Um, and a new um, special issue of the, um, the journal Global Public Health came out in May, and it talks about ways to use social epidemiology to integrate both qualitative and quantitative data. And one of the papers um, promotes the idea of reflexive epidemiology that links social science critique with epidemiologic analyses to try to unpack things like sexual identity from gender identity. And I think that these kinds of out-of-the-box ways of, of bringing different kinds of data together are going to be necessary if we're really going to have a, a true sense of what um, key populations need to prevent um, new infections from occurring. But there have been a number of transformations in recent years um, in terms of uh, transgender communities. So um, at the um, International AIDS Conference prior to this one, um, there was a, a, a focus on um, trans women in particular. And um, it, it's good to see that only two years later, um, the National Institute of Health has funded the first two um, behavioral intervention studies specifically for transgender women. Um, and some graphics from these studies are shown here. And these were actually not just developed for trans women, but by trans women. And they were um, meaningful members of the, of the research team. And th these studies are, are ongoing on the East Coast. Um, CDC uh, has proclaimed a, a National Transgender HIV Testing Day. And at the International AIDS Conference in Durban, there was the rollout of new comprehensive HIV and STI pro programs for transgender people. And again, this was um, planned with the transgender community at the table. And so this was real progress. <laughs> 
but it's not all good news for all sexual minorities, um, and in particular for younger men having sex with men. So this is a slide from the U.S. Um, Centers for Disease Control showing HIV diagnoses among men having sex with men by age from 2010 to 2014. And what you see that is in the older age groups, there's been a flattening um, and with a slight increase among the youngest age group, 13 to 24, but a large increase among men who are in the 25 to, to 34 age group. And um, if we look more closely at the youngest age group of 13 to 24 year olds who are MSM, you see that over half of them are um, black or African American and one quarter are Hispanic. So um, we have a real issue here among young MSM of color in this country. And this is something that isn't new. We've known about it for a number of years now, but we have yet to really make a dent. And this is a really major tragedy because when you look at HIV incidence among men having sex with men in upper and lower middle income countries, as you can tell from this, um, these two um, graphs, the, um, that this is actually the HIV incidence among African American men having sex with men from the previous slide. It, it, it's, it's huge compared to other countries. So this is, um, is probably um, priority number one, at least in my mind, for the United States. So what can we do? Well, one of the potential interventions for men having sex with men is um, PrEP. And um, there's been a considerable attention placed on pre-exposure prophylaxis um, and among um, MSM. And this slide shows the cost effectiveness of PrEP for MSM versus people who inject drugs in the United States. And it combines data from a number of sources, so I'll walk you through it. The first take home message is that PrEP is cost effective for the 20% MSM who are the riskiest, assuming that we know who they are. Uh, the second take home message is that PrEP is not cost effective for people who inject drugs. And um, as you can see here, it's PrEP for 25% of people who inject drugs. It's, it's extremely um, costly. Um, and um, the, the, one of the issues here is, is the high cost of Truvada. And there's a linear relationship between the cost effectiveness um, and the cost. So if the cost of Truvada was actually dropped by 50%, there would be um, an improvement in, uh, in the cost effectiveness by 50%. So, to me, it doesn't take rocket science to think that, you know, the cost must go down. There have been price breaks for um, some lower and middle income countries, but all the G8 countries have to pay top dollar for Travada. And given the incidents that we're seeing among young MSM, especially those of color, um, we need to ensure that PrEP can be scaled up. It's not um, nearly penetrating the community. Well, that's probably a bad word to use. Um, it, it's not um, getting into the community to the extent that it needs to. Um, but the third um, take home message from this slide is that um, we see that the cost effectiveness for an intervention like needle exchange programs is extremely cost effective. And yet, we know that needle exchanges work. We've shown um, efficacy studies dating back to the 1980s, and yet needle exchanges haven't brought, been brought to scale in almost every country of the world. So we have a long way to go. And it's in my view that PrEP is a really important intervention that does need to be scaled up, but we shouldn't do it at the expense of interventions that we know work. So in you know, the last part of my presentation, it, I wanted to take some time to reflect on previous international AIDS conferences because speakers like me spend a lot of time thinking about this, standing up in front of all of our peers, and yet we need to really um, hold ourselves accountable as communities. If, if we're supposed to be highlighting the most important challenges um, for tackling the epidemic, if, if we're going to you know, have an AIDS-free generation, then how have we addressed some of the concerns that have been raised at previous conferences? So let's take a look at some of these. In um, uh, 2008, at the Mexico City International AIDS Conference, uh, my colleague Adiba Kamar Alzaman from Malaysia said, treatment for substance use is HIV prevention. So what have we done in this respect? Well, this is a slide from um, a Lancet Commission special issue that came out in March. And it shows the extent of drug-dependent services by region in the world 
Um, and um, on the left is detoxification. On the right is opioid substitution therapy or opiate agonist um, treatment. And um, you'll see here that um, only in Europe and to a, an increasing extent in Asia, but not nearly enough, is um, opioid substitution therapy been brought to scale. We see that it's very low in the Americas and, and in Africa. And so um, we really need to ensure that we are scaling up um, treatment um, for drug dependence, not only due to HIV, um, the need to combat this epidemic, but also because there's epidemics that are surging um, on, on her uh, with respect to heroin and other opiates. And so um, it's, it, these two epidemics are, are twinned. And in fact, there have been recent outbreaks of HIV among people who inject drugs in Greece and Romania. These are um, epidemic curves um, from countries all over the world. And here in the United States, we had an, um, an epidemic that surprised everyone in um, rural Indiana. Um, there was an outbreak of HIV among people who inject drugs. Um, and... Um, Almost 200 people became newly infected with HIV. They were all injection drug users, and this is a region where they had previously seen only about five HIV cases in a year, and the 200 cases occurred within um, a six-month period. And um, un unfortunately, this is also a state that um, had um, made needle exchanges um, illegal. Uh, they had um, rolled back... Um, uh, HIV testing because it was uh, provided through Planned Parenthood and we all know that some people have a hard time uh, swallowing um, abortion services so as a result um, the HIV testing um, units were closed down. There was virtually no op opioid substitution therapy and that was made even worse because there was delayed Medicaid expansion. So total recipe for an epidemic in Scott County, Indiana. There's lots of other counties that have the same problems in the United States right now, and we have a major opioid epidemic. So um, I think that this is actually a national disgrace. But there's other parts of the world are also seeing um, high HIV prevalence among people who inject drugs, um, particularly in parts of Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. This slide shows that there's a high HIV prevalence among people who inject drugs in Kenya, and it's associated with um, low viral load suppression. So in um, the coast of, of Kenya and in Nairobi, you can see that within five years of beginning to inject drugs that we have um, almost 20% of people who inject drugs um, who become HIV infected. And the um, percentage of people with viral load suppression is less than 5% in both of these regions. So Kenya is one of the countries in Africa that has actually successfully um, implemented opioid substitution therapy, at least uh, in terms of a pilot program. Um, they've also um, been trying to expand into retroviral treatment, but um, they're really going to need to scale these up dramatically if they're going to make a dent on this epidemic given its scale. Now let's look at um, the lower and middle income countries with the highest antiretroviral coverage. Um, you'll see here um, we have Botswana at 70% at the top, but we have Mexico at almost 50% um, at the other end of the scale. Now this slide really shocked me because obviously um, we've been working in Mexico, especially in Tijuana, um, for the last um, decade, and I knew that we didn't have HIV um, um, contained um, in terms of our access to antiretroviral treatment. So, um, you know, I think that this next slide really shows that there's dramatic differences within um, countries and even within cities in terms of key populations. Um, this is um, a paper that um, was published by Laramie Smith, who um, is part of our team. She took the almost 200 cases of people living with HIV in Tijuana that had been identified through our studies and looked at the HIV cascade. So um, less than 50% had ever been tested before they were diagnosed in our studies. 11% um, knew their HIV positive status. 11% were linked to care and less than 5% were receiving antiretroviral treatment. So a major difference compared to the national estimate that you've just seen, which is almost at 50%. So this is a real word of, of caution for those of us who are um, looking at data. Um, it, you know, you need to look at data quality, but you have to understand that there are dramatic uh, 
sub-epidemics that could be happening regionally. Um, in this particular case, um, that access to antiretrovirals was much lower for injection drug users and sex workers compared to men having sex with men. And um, this slide is um, from uh, Sanjay Mehta and, and Davy Smith's group. And I wanted to, whoops, I wanted to show it to you because um, I wanted to just give a local flavor. And of course, now I can't go back. Here we go. I think I can do it. There we go. Um, so um, I wanted to show this slide because um, and one epidemic like what's going on in Tijuana isn't static. We know that there's a lot of migration and cross-border transmission. And one of the novel things that um, Sanjay and Davy have done is to take all of the HIV um, positive samples from our studies in Tijuana and sequence them, and then to compare them to um, you know, the genetic makeup of, of the HIV cases diagnosed in San Diego, and to look at the binational clusters. And um, what they have shown is that there's a, a high proportion of, of clusters that are involving sex work. And um, so um, when we look at this over time, um, what Sanjay has done more recently is look at the timing of, of viral migration between San Diego and Tijuana. And he showed that um, this is, in red is from, from Tijuana to San Diego, and in blue is from San Diego to Tijuana. And as you can see, um, earlier in the epidemic, more infections were flowing from north to south. But more recently, it, the infections have been flowing from south to north. And so this has an impact on um, San Diego's HIV epidemic as well. The data from um, Rich Garfield's um, cohort of um, people living um, with uh, people in, who inject drugs in San Diego show that HIV prevalence among this population is about 10%. So it's not a static epidemic. They are becoming more and more linked, and an understanding of the cross-border transmission dynamics is essential. So now let's look at the lower and middle income countries with the lowest antiretroviral coverage and see if we can identify some patterns. So here we have um, Guinea-Bissau, it's almost at 19%, and Madagascar at 1% at the bottom. Now if you look at these um, countries, um, DRC, Sierra Leone, CAF, Indonesia, Sudan, Pakistan, Iran, and South Sudan, it was striking that many of these are countries that have experienced considerable armed conflict or coup d'etat or natural disasters. So HIV is just one of many different um, issues that these countries are facing. And it's not high on the priority list. So what this suggests is that we really need to engage um, the public security sector, the economic sector, to help um, people understand that HIV is going to have a major impact on development if um, it's not taken into account. And the other issue is that, uh, that many of these countries, even in the top 10, they're very dependent on global fund support. And we know that um, global fund support has been in jeopardy because uh, very few countries have been you know, contributing. So um, we have seen advances, but they're very tenuous. So let's reflect now uh, to 20 years ago, IAS 1996 in Vancouver, um, where the late, great Jonathan Mann gave a keynote and said to uproot the epidemic, it will be necessary to deal with its root societal causes, namely a lack of respect for human rights. He couldn't have been more correct. So what have we done um, with the human rights aspect of the epidemic? Well, this is a slide showing um, HIV prevalence um, in um, um, men having sex with men um, in um, Nigeria, and this is pre and post new laws that even are more restrictive about criminalizing homosexuality. So as you can see here, after the law was implemented, um, men having sex with men were more likely to fear seeking health care, to say that there were no safe place to go to socialize with other MSM. They avoided seeking health care. They were more likely to be verbally harassed, and they were more likely to report blackmail. So this is a country where HIV prevalence is 45% among MSM and HIV incidence is 14%. And we know that laws like this are actually undermining our attempts to um, roll out HIV testing and treatment. So this is really a, 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 a disgrace. And um, we, we need to ensure that we can be um, working with these um, legislators to 
to ensure that the human rights of, of men having sex with men and other sexual minorities are, are protected. Um, not just for HIV, but because um, these, uh, these people are just so incredibly persecuted that if they come out at all, they may be put to death. In um, 2006, um, 10 years ago at the International AIDS Conference, Chris Beyer, who is the um, now the outgoing president of the IAS, said, HIV risks are at the individual level, but their drivers are structural. Now, what do we mean by structural? Well, this is a schematic showing what's called the HIV risk environment, which is a concept that Tim Rhodes first introduced and um, that we have integrated into our work in Tijuana and elsewhere. And it shows that at the um, host level, there are host dynamics and, and factors that are endogenous to the individual, like, like sex and age. Um, but at the um, environmental level, we have both macro and micro factors that um, operate at different types. There's physical, social, economic, and policy. And these factors interact. And so there are both risk and protective factors that over time have an impact on um, HIV risk. And it's not only epidemiologists that are considering these structural factors. Even molecular epidemiology has shown that it makes a difference. So this is a slide from a paper that just came out in June um, and uh, shows the HIV-1 um, molecular surveillance over time. And it shows that HIV spread along specific migration routes that are consistent with geopolitical factors like migration, tourism, and trade. And in fact, most of the um, HIV infections were influenced by factors that were strong in North America. So most of the infections actually went from North America to Europe and other countries rather than coming from places like Africa. So. Uh, sorry, Donald Trump. Uh, the molecular surveillance um, has shown that um, you know we, we really need to be looking at factors that you know are structural in nature and and not factors that are going to be driving more stigma and um, discrimination. So then the question becomes: if, if structural factors are important, can we reverse HIV epidemics with Chris? criminal justice, and, and policing reforms? Well, the data suggests that, they're, they're, that we can. Um, so this is a slide coming from the um, Lancet series that was released at the conference on HIV in prisons. And um, our wonderful mathematical modeler, Natasha Martin, actually um, was involved in some of the modeling work here. And this slide is, is um, pretty complex, so I'll walk you through part of it. It shows um, the percentage of new infections among people who inject drugs in Ukraine that would be uh, averted if either incarceration no longer elevated HIV transmission, or there was new, no new incarceration of people who inject drugs, or if we scaled up opioid substitution therapy um, with or without retention um, post-release. So you'll see here that the full pro pro projection shows that if our incarceration no longer elevated HIV transmission, it would have a major impact on the epidemic. However, that's not a realistic scenario. So what if we look um, at, um, you know, if there's no new incarceration of people who inject drugs? And that actually only has a modest impact on the epidemic because of the continued impact of people who were previously incarcerated. So then what if we look at the scale up of opioid agonist treatment? So again, we're thinking of methadone maintenance and buprenorphine. So if we have a 50% scale up and um, we um, make these treatments for drug dependence available after people are released from prison, we can almost reduce 20% of new HIV infections um, between the periods 2015 and 2030. And this is diminished somewhat if there's no um, retention in opioid agonist treatments post-release. So, so starting opioid agonist um, treatment in prison and carrying it through post-release um, is going to have a major impact on epidemics. And, and this isn't just the case in a place like Ukraine, but even in the United States where most people who are incarcerated don't have access to these treatments. So um, we do have a number of challenges uh, that we need to face uh, and, and as a society if we're going to continue to um, see advances in, in uh, preventing HIV AIDS in the future. And some of these major challenges are lack of donor commitment to the Global Fund and it threatens to undermine some of the advances that I presented earlier in the presentation. 
We also have seen um, other challenges, um, some surprisingly um, implemented by the U.S. National Institute of Health. Um, they recently abandoned set-aside funding for HIV research. There had um, typically been 10% of the budget um, set aside for HIV. And they also reprioritized HIV research funding to focus almost exclusively on biomedical aspects to the extent that social and behavioral aspects are excluded and considered low priority. And this, we feel, is going to have a, a major impact on, on research and um, is going to be deleterious in nature. And in Brazil, and this is a country that was the first lower and middle income country to implement universal access to antiretroviral um, treatment free for all people who were medically eligible, there has been a, a dramatic political turmoil and now the national antiretroviral treatment program is under threat and uh, may indeed be mis dismantled. So we cannot afford to let these things happen. So what do we do about it? Well, I like to think back um, on the words of Greg Gonzalez, a person living with HIV um, and a colleague um, who is now just getting his PhD at Yale University. At the IAS conference in 2006, 10 years ago, he said, we need to reinscribe the fight against AIDS as part of a larger movement for social and economic justice. So we need to be holding ourselves accountable as a community that we aren't just islands into ourselves. If we have enough evidence, we must act. It's our duty, and that's why I believe that we go into research in the first place so that we can make a difference. So um, I urge all of you, as members of the HIV community, that as you go out in the community and you, as you read the news and as you look and go to conferences, that you don't just watch, you see. You don't just listen, you hear. And you don't just think, you act. Because if we've learned anything from the history of South Africa, it's that there is a hidden secret activist in all of us, and so I am one too. Because we can never forget that silence still equals death. Thank you very much. So I wanted to make a couple of acknowledgments. A lot of people um, provided images, um, data, um, thoughts, quotes, um, and listened to countless practice sessions um, of my talk, including many people who've come here and were at the conference and have seen it now many, many times. Um, special thanks to Through Positive Eyes, which is a global exhibition to banish, banish HIV stigma. Um, it was coordinated by the group at UCLA, and they actually had many of the photographers who were at the meeting. So these are people living with HIV AIDS. They taught them how to become photographers. They took s pictures of their lives. So all of the images that are in this talk, feel free to use them. They are obtained with permission, and they really speak to the story. And I also want to thank all of you in this room. Uh, many of you know that over the last year, um, my husband and I have been through a terrible ordeal um, where he almost lost his life. And um, about half of the people in this room came to see him in the hospital. And um, he said to me that one of the things that kept him alive was knowing that his life mattered because all of you played a role in that with your vigils, with your candles, with the food that you brought. And um, he couldn't be here today, um, but he insisted that I go to the conference because I, I made that commitment to the AIDS community, and I'm happy to have shared this with you today. So thank you very much. I think there's time for questions, Doug. Of course, there's time for questions. Okay. Or comments? Sarah? You have the statistics in the United States for young African American males, and you have your work on, uh, you, you showed the slide on incarceration in the Ukraine. So, have we looked closely at the overlap in the US? Because we know there's a very overrepresented 
um, number of that age group of African American males incarcerated in prisons in the United States, and I just wondered if that's been closely looked at yet. Yeah, I don't have those data at my fingertips, but clearly, I mean, we have an overrepresentation of African American young men in, in incarceration and um, in jails and prisons, especially jails. Um, and we know that um, a lot of uh, men having sex with men are in, in jails as, as well. Um, and so I think that there's considerable overlap. But um, I would think that um, somebody like um, Rick Altice would have those data um, because he's been doing studies um, of, of people who are incarcerated um, and, and post-release. Um, and we also need to consider that it isn't just um, men having sex with men who have that identity. There's also rape in prison. And um, I believe that, um, that the HIV in prison special issue um, took that issue on. But it's one that I think is the elephant in the living room because, um, you know, we, we really don't provide the services. And we know that, that inter interpersonal violence is a major contributor as well. So I think that there's, it's multi-layered. And um, if, you, if anyone in this room can comment on that issue, um, I, I welcome the response. Thank you. Is there a question here on the side? Do you have a question or a comment? Oh, no, you're just walking with the microphone. OK. Um, yes. I thought there was someone over there. OK. Go ahead. Hi. Oh, sorry, um, yes. Sorry, sorry pardon. Um, so earlier you mentioned the reduce in funds and support for HIV research, and so I was wondering if you could provide advice for up-and-coming researchers on how to conquer this who are dedicated to um, the HIV mission. Well, the first thing you can do is vote on <laughs> November 8th. Um, that's, I think, the most important thing. Um, and I think that, you know, we, we do have the opportunity to um, influence our, our policy makers and speaking up to who our congressmen and my, mine's Daryl Issa, so have pity on me. Um, but um, I, I think that um, when there's open forum uh, to the NIH to, to obtain feedback, um, that, that making sure that you know you, you answer those calls and you say what an impact it's going to have. But the, failing those things, um, I, I think that young researchers need to take a good hard look at the research priorities that have been set out and determine, okay, how, does, how do my research interests and my training fit into these? And it's not something that, you know, you can do necessarily on your own. I think getting together with other colleagues and figuring out what potential angles are and talking to program officers and even um, you know, division chiefs at um, the NIH. They, it's, it's, this, this problem is facing all of us right now and there are, there are ways to think about things um, and th there are new RFAs that are coming out that are addressing the quote unquote high priority research areas and those generally are going to be, you know, those that that the um, specific institutes have kind of angled their pitch at. So, for, for example, the National Institute on Drug Abuse has um, the Seek, Test, Treat, and Retain initiative embedded in this, focused on substance use, and, um, and is trying to Im integrate co-infections into this um, framework as well, as well as implementation science. Um, I think it's a challenge, and um, perhaps the CIFAR could play a role in this as well. I know that um, because um, CIFAR is funded by NIAD, that um, you know when the directors all get together, that they um, have a, an opportunity to to ha raise concerns and take those back to the institute. But also, CIFAR could play a role in terms of having workshops to help investigators um, that are struggling or that are writing their first R01 think of ways in which their research can be responsive. Because if you don't have high priority research and you're not citing those um, NOT guidelines from August 12, 2015 in your, um, your, your AIMS page, then you're putting yourself at a, a, a steep disadvantage. Um, and I think, Chip, did you have a comment on, on that that you wanted to make? Is there anybody else who'd like to um, take on that question? Because I don't think there's just one answer. I think that all of us, including the senior researchers, are facing this, this challenge as well. It's a tough time to be a scientist. Very nice talk. Um, Thank you. Seth, um, Seth, um, 
I'm Millie, and I have a question. Is there, like, in the community, are are there, like, um, I know in 1999, I remember there used to be a lot of outreach and community services about, like, um, having injection needles um, for free and condoms, um, but I don't see that anymore nowadays. And so is, a, is there also a push for, like, um, just like the word of mouth to get around to providing like um, needle exchanges like in places like Tijuana and or in just social events like yeah well I'm I think that there have been uh, advances in needle exchange programs in particular harm reduction as kind of a movement has has come more become more accepted um, and we hope on after November 8th that it will be more so. Um, but for example, Indiana had to learn the hard way, right, with their Scott County outbreak. So their governor, who happens to be Mike Pence, hmm, when that name's in the news a lot late, he actually um, delayed um, needle exchange and was t totally against it and kept the, the legislation in place that would, you know, criminalize. Um, you know, the distribution of needles through needle exchange or, or anything else. But finally, he was pressured um, to make a needle exchange um, available in Scott County. Now, other counties have to declare a public emergency before they can open a needle exchange, which, um, you know, I actually wrote a New England Journal of Medicine commentary on this and said that's the exact opposite of what you want to do because to prevent something, you need to get there before there's a public emergency. Um, so. There, there have been some steps forward, but it's been very slow and not adequate. Tijuana does have a needle exchange program. It's very, very small, um, and it's, it's almost a drop in the bucket in terms of the number of needles it, it, it's able to exchange. But my own view on needle exchange programs, because this is an area I've worked in for a long time, is that it isn't just the needle that's, a t that's, that's important. It's all the wraparound services like you know, HIV testing and counseling, on-site uh, STD diagnosis and treatment, TB um, treatment, which can be directly observed therapy, um, you know, vitamins, um, naloxone provision, all, and referrals to, um, to drug abuse treatment. So all of those things can be provided within the context of a needle exchange program, and really um, antiretroviral treatment, of course, can be implemented as well. There is a harm reduction conference that's going to be held in San Diego the first week in November. It's put on by the Harm Reduction Coalition, and if you're interested, you should go, because all of the people who are involved in harm reduction across the country and Latin America are going to be there, and many people in this room who are doing this kind of work are going to be there as well, and they can tell you more about the types of work um, in San Diego and, and in Tijuana that are, that are going on in this area. But thank you for your question. Very good, thank you.